on Scott for a hemo day. Okay, can we have the, oh, yeah, sure. Malaysia, he or they. Can we have the team on proposition introducing themselves, testing their mics, and that we have the opposition do the, the, the same? Can you hear us? Okay, I'm Emily. I'll be the first speaker. I'm Mybret. I'll be the second speaker, and I'm doing the reply as well. Okay, can anyone hear me? Cool. Um, my name is Sarah. I'll be the third speaker. My pronouns are she, her. The opposition? Hi, I'm, oh, can everybody hear and see me? Okay, my name is Jania Kaur and I am the O1 and the reply. Hi, I'm Rohan Aidu, I am O2. Hi, I'm Chisumino, I'm the O3. Okay, thanks to the teams and the panelists. Just give me a second to put up the stopwatch on the zoom so we can all see it okay now that we can all see the i hope you can all see the stopwatch I think so. And I would like, like to invite the first speaker of the proposition to begin the case for the proposition side. Here, here. For decades, courts have sworn to become better, more fair, and finally pursue the cause of justice. But no matter how many sensitivity programs, diversity hiring, or broken promises we've had, judges continue to deny justice to the poor, the most marginalized, and those yearning to be free. On proposition, we've had enough. Proud to propose. Before moving into our first two constructives on fair outcomes and accountability, our model, six parts here. Firstly, criminal sentencing refers to the process after a defendant is convicted. Secondly, under our side, all human judgment in the process will be replaced by a simple input-output open-sourced algorithm. Thirdly, the algorithm will have numerous input factors and ultimately generate a sentence as an output. The sentence would be aligned with individual countries' sentencing policies. Two notes on the, under the inputs. A, we would take into account age, criminal history, and other factors included in criminal sentencing. Importantly, however, we would also factor in and positively discriminate for things such as race, poverty, and a history of abuse. These factors would mitigate or lower the sentence of the criminal if they were from a marginalized, historically marginalized community. But B, the algorithm would additionally discriminate between violent and nonviolent crime. This means that a homeless man with multiple charges of loitering would not have this held against him, whereas an abusive husband with several arrests would have this counted against him. But fourthly, in terms of transparency, we would take a couple of precautions. Firstly, we would take make the inputs and their relative weight known to the general public. But secondly, if a convict wishes an explanation for their sentence, an expert on the algorithm will be able to provide a justification like we see judges do in the status quo. But fifthly, we know that the, the, although the algorithm may be produced by private entities, the government will have the ultimate say over all the factors included and would be held accountable for failures of the algorithm. But finally, we that the, the, if the defendants feel as though they have been falsely sentenced, they will have the right to appeal the algorithm itself or challenge the factors put into the algorithm in front of a diverse panel. With this, our stance in today's debate, we do not have to prove that the algorithm is flawless, simply that there are structural reasons as to why human subjectivity taints justice, and that we can ensure a comparatively better world on the proposition. Additionally, we believe that a natural extension of this motion would be the repeal of mandatory minimum sentencing laws and other unjust legislative intervention into the justice system, given that they undermine algorithm-based sentencing. With this, moving into our uh, first constructive on fair outcomes. The thesis of this is that human nature and judgment will always be subjective and biased to the detriment of justice. Algorithm-based sentencing will be fair and consistent. Humans are fundamentally more irrational and subjective given conscious and subconscious biases and are swayed by factors that are irrelevant to the crime. Three things to note here. 
Firstly, the judge's own personal state of mind has a huge impact on their choice. For example, right. evidence has shown that seemingly meaningless factors like what the lunch had for uh, lunch, what the judge had for lunch, and how much these, the judge slept, has a significant impact on the sentencing. A study covered in the business Harvard Business Review found that forty minutes less sleep for judges meant five percent longer sentences for convicts. But secondly, we that a defendant's social markers, such as clothing, tattoos, or language, often lead to stereotyping and higher sentences. Studies have similarly shown that defendants wearing suits, being shaved, and wearing glasses are more likely to get lower sentences than those who don't. Thirdly, racial and ethnic biases risk of being factored into sentencing caused by the internalization of societal prejudice. Many judges, like all humans, are shaped by these stereotypes that pervade our society, such as the anti-Muslim sentiment in Europe or the anti-Black racism we see in the United States. Moreover, judges are predisposed to sympathize with people who look like themselves. Given the, their own likelihood of coming from privileged yeah. background, this means that judges are more likely to empathize with the most privileged defendants. As a case in point, the judge who gave Brock Turner a six, month, six months for sexual assault likely did so because he identified and felt sympathetic with his plight in a way that he never would a minority or a poor defendant. Finally, it's important to note that no amount of training can ever override this. This is fundamentally rooted in human psychology to form snap decisions and to empathize with people we see ourselves in, even if we pledge not to. But before I move on, yes, I'll take your view on it. No? Okay, moving on. Now, why does this matter to criminal justice system? Well, principally, it leads to inconsistent punishment that undermines the rule of law. For justice to be meaningful, it must be applied uniformly. And judges who sentence differently based on their the defendant's appearance, their own mood, or other arbitrary factors principally violate this promise. It is wrong for two people who have committed the same crime to get different amounts of time. And the proposition uniquely fixes this. But it it means that the vulnerable defendants are yeah. routinely over sentenced and the criminals who are committed who have committed harm to society or unfairly experience unfair leniency. In the same month that a young African American mother was sentenced to five years for lying on her son's application to a public school, countless millionaires' parents received only community service, even though they were convicted of illegally buying their children access to elite universities. Now, how are computer algorithms better? Two ways here. Firstly, algorithms are not swayed by subjective variables, such as appearance or charisma, to the same extent. Realize that even if we're unable to free our data from being tainted by structural racism, discrimination by judges above and beyond data, and we will certainly be ready for this on the proposition. But before I move on, I'll take a break. Tell us how you're doing value human judgment, but a diverse panel is still making the final decision for an individual once they are able to appeal it. We think that these individuals have far greater incentive to actually make this like, fair and equal because like they this is something that being done publicly so but secondly we also in our model very much included like affirmative action policies to ensure the best possible outcomes but secondly or like the second big algorithms are better we think there's the very next metric is unlikely to be racist because a a diverse board is very likely to be sensitive to these issues but b there's transparency guaranteed given the inputs are available for review and scrutiny and we think it's likely that ngos like the innocence project are going to shed light on the possible bias but c we think that the data is regularly updated means that there's a faster turnover period than the time which is just first which is for life but this moving to a second part, the thesis here is that it is easier to hold algorithms accountable than human judges, that they're more likely to keep corruption and bias in check. Three reasons why judges cannot be properly held accountable. Firstly, judges enjoy a level of symbolic legitimacy and social prestige, which makes it particularly difficult to call them out or hold them accountable. Judges likewise carry an assumption of wisdom and truth, and an assumption that is even more true when compared to the stigma attached to being like a, a criminal. What this means is that the public is more likely to defer to the experience and education of a judge than the criminal claiming bias. But secondly, we think that judges are deeply connected to the power structures meant to hold them accountable. Prosecutors and defense attorneys, for example, are hesitant to challenge judges because it may disadvantage them in future cases. But the panels meant to review their decisions are often off, often also made up of other judges who are unlikely to want to like and want to protect their judge friends. But finally, the structures of many judicial systems makes it impossible for oppressed minorities to actually hold judges accountable. Whether it be elected judges who only have to appeal to the basis majority, or whether it be a lifetime of 
appointed judges who by design are immune to democratic accountability. Algorithms, on the other hand, are far more accountable. Societies have less of an automatic deference to technology and are in fact far more skeptical to machine-made decisions and therefore more willing to challenge biases if they have occurred. Machines likewise don't get offended or defensive when accused of sexism and don't have robot friends trying to protect them from accountability. The impact here is massive panel. Not only is AI factually less likely to be racist to begin with, but insofar as they sometimes can be subject to some discriminatory tendencies, it can be far better held accountable. Justice can therefore only be meaningful we achieve on the proposition proud to the host. I thank the first speaker of the proposition and invite the first speaker of the opposition to begin their case. Here. Can everybody see and hear me properly? Can everybody see and hear me properly? Yes. Okay, perfect. Also, oh, sorry, I'll um, appreciate verbal POIs. Okay. When minorities are systemically denied access, representation, and a voice in a broken system, side proposition puts a band aid on that system and refuses to heal it from within. We refuse to stand with the side that does that. Before I so before I get on to anything, let's note here that it is really simple for both sides to throw around a bunch of examples. However, the team that wins this debate is a team that proves why structurally they achieve the most amount of change. We'll be proving to you this in the following case. I'll be talking about how, one, why data is, this data is going to lead to terrible outcomes, but second of all, why they reduce accountability in the judicial system. And my second speaker, Rohan, will be talking about how the criminal justice system needs to adapt to societal values, but also how it is represented to quantify the human experience to numbers. Before I get on to that, let's deal with some context and clarity as well as some rebuttal. First of all, there's three pieces to this. First of all, what is this debate realistically about? It was unstrategic for the first speaker to waste a big chunk of their speech talking about the issues within the criminal justice system. That's not what this debate is about, and reasonably not what we have to defend. This debate is about understanding that these issues exist and then noting which side provides the best realistic alternative. We think we do that best. Second of all, what do these algorithms realistically look like? We tell you that they're not incredibly advanced artificial intelligence. As the motion suggests, these are basic computer algorithms that rely on predictive data. They rely on data that to make like intense correlations, but more than that, they need human input to plug in data and selectively choose which data to use. We'll explain to you why that's extremely harmful later on. But thirdly, what is our alternative and stance? Note here that if they have the political capital to replace all judges' algorithms, we have the political capital to make major reforms and changes to the system. But before that, let's just note a big concession in the case. They value human judgment because they introduce their appeal mechanism and their appeal system to show a diverse panel and to show a panel that can empathize and understand people's experiences. We tell you that that's, that is our model and that is not mutually exclusive to their side. But note here that if they want to quantify the human experience with these diverse panels, we tell you then the entire like effect of first of all, like humans being biased and humans being irrational and eating lunch completely goes out of their case. But second of all, all the harms are existing because they introduce human judgment within this. So what is our alternative and stance? Note here, if they have the political capital to replace all judges um, with algorithms, we, we can also do that with our resources. So what is the actual issue? Judges aren't the inherent issue. Judges are a symptom of the entrenched issues that exist within the legal system. We need to focus on fixing that. What do these issues systemically look like? One, past historical injustices mean that there is a lack of diversity and representation within the justice system. Therefore, judges are predominantly white. But second of all, legal education is really expensive and ranges from fifty to $100,000 a year, which minority students can't realistically access. Thirdly, because prosecutors are also predominantly white, they select judges and juries, which uh, leads to a lack of uh, judges and juries that are predominantly white, which leads to a lack of representation. Yeah. And, and those juries are the ones that are like prosecuting minorities to death penalty. The overall consequence is a, a system that is set up against minorities and is unwilling to empathize with them. We fix that by ensuring one, intense funding of minority legal education. Second of all, affirmative action policies that allow for diverse juries and judges in sentencing, especially because juries are often regular citizens and this is very easy to do that. 
but B, by ensuring an extremely diverse panel as they want, especially with the minority of cases where you can have two thirds um, of minority um, individuals represented. On our side, we tell you that we fix the actual issues that are fostered on an un un unempathetic system. They can see to these issues, they've already lost this debate on background. But now let's move on to my first argument about why the data is going to lead to terrible outcomes. Before that, I'll take a quick POI. Judges are inherently well-educated and wealthy. You can see this. Even in your best-case scenarios where minorities are represented, it will still be the most privileged among them. And how does this really fix okay. internal bias and discrimination? Okay, I get with that. I, okay, first of all, not true, because oftentimes juries are just basic citizens that are selected on the street. We can do that by making sure that diverse panels and diverse juries are selected. But B, we can have more minority education, as we've already said in our stance. So let's go on to my first uh, point about how the data is going to lead to terrible outcomes. Here we've been proving to you that even with the best of intentions, there are structural issues that cannot be overcome, which will lead to the data bringing out bad outcomes. Three reasons. One, and you need a lot of data to make these correlations. So side proposition has two options here. A, they can use current data, where all the problems of excessive policing in, um, in, in poor neighborhoods and mass incarceration because of historical injustices yield data that biases the against people from specific minority groups and low-income communities. The data is likely to show that low-income people are the ones committing the worst crimes or affect the biases of that broken system, whereby minorities form the majorities of that prison system. Therefore, what this does is that in, the risk, in its risk assessment, it completes correlation with causation in order to calculate risk. As a low-income person, you are likely to get a higher risk assessment and score, uh, and score, and therefore higher sentences. Because based on the algorithm data, you are sure to be more likely to recommit crimes. No, thank you. But B, they have another option. They can collect new data. Two issues with that. A, it takes a very, very, very long time to have all the correlations and data to be input. So all the short-term harms with the current system still exist because they need to collect loads of data for it to actually work. But B, this still relies on the structural problems that haven't been changed. They're going to come up here and say that they're going to fix that too. But no sure they only have a limited amount of political capital and a limited amount of power to actually change the legal system, um, which, you, which you can't do when you've already used up most of that by changing their yeah, old judges to algorithms. So, um, but second of all, we tell you that they reflect human biases, right? An algorithm can only understand data that the human inputs, right? But also, it's a reflection of the bias that the person is putting the data in. Who are the people that understand algorithms the most? Who are the people at the top? We tell you that these are the Silicon Valley elites, Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of Google, Elon Musk. These are a, this is a general algorithm. When they create it, it, they select data that they think is valuable. So, for example, income and education. Let's look at our worst case and best case. On our worst case, we tell you one racist judge, one minority racist judge, has a couple of individuals that they deal with in their case. But on their worst case, we tell you, and if the entire algorithm is skewed by one person creating it, every single person it touches is hurt. We refuse to stand by that. We tell you that we are far better on the, uh, on the comparative because one, judges are more diverse, therefore they are more likely to be empathetic. Two, they care about promotions and being voted in. So if they're racist, they're going to lose and not be promoted. But three, appeals are a deterrent because it doesn't reflect well if your decisions are constantly getting appealed. And lastly, we think that these are generally people that care about making fair decisions and are likely to do it because they've worked so hard to be in that position of power. We are far better on that comparative. But second of all, Let's talk about why they significantly reduce accountability in the justice system. So this is the most, like, this is a really important thing because, in so far as both systems have biases, the issue is is how do we hold these systems accountable? Why is it structurally impossible for them to do this? One, because of perfection bias. People tend to believe that big tech is invaluable, and at the point at which machines can make outcomes about sentencing, people are far more likely to say that this is not wrong. But two, there's no way to understand the algorithm's uh, decisions and the, and the litigants from victims to lawyers to judges do not understand complex data that is in everyday language. You can't understand the reasoning behind it because the data is hard to access. The process of applying that information is also very, very hard, which disproportionately hurts minorities that can't get uh, like a tech lawyer. What this means is that people are unlikely to appeal. And in the best case, if it reaches a final human judge in a panel, they also don't understand this data either, either and don't understand the reasoning behind the data. But also then they can see to all the harms about human judges, all the harms about human panels. They don't actually fix much at all. We are so proud to oppose. Thank you. I thank the first speaker of the opposition and invite the second speaker of the proposition. Here, here. Can I 
like one year me? Panel, South Africa is already losing this round because all their benefits were banked on them proving that their characterization of the world was at all reasonable. I'm going to prove why it wasn't and why them then not engaging with the bulk of our case was so strategically detrimental. Three things in my speech. Firstly, on their stance. Secondly, on their constructive material. And thirdly, on my own third point, on trust and efficiency. Let's first deal with their stance then, which was basically a crush that held up most of their case. Let's take it down. I think when they tell you that they themselves can see that there are structural reasons as to why judges are not diverse, I think it is important to note that that means that they require massive political change. I think that's a pretty unfeasible, infeasible stance already. We realize there are also lots of reasons why minorities do not join the criminal justice system, also like apathy towards the system, also just not having any access to these kinds of resources. I think that requires massive political upkeep. But then secondly, I think that is specifically ridiculous when they say that they're using our like fiat power because we never claimed that we could or would diverse diversified judges, but rather that we could establish a panel attuned to racism that may exist. We don't think that requires at all the same kind of political capital that they would just magic want to have on their side of the house. But then additionally, at their best, they make it some diverse judges. But listen, they will be the most privileged, the most advantaged. And additionally, minorities themselves can absolutely have internalized biases, like female judges often having outdated, misogynistic conceptions of things like victim blaming. But last, realize that while the for like race to some extent, it does not address the heart of the problem, that humans are biased when it comes to income, to sexuality, to gender, and that this leads to inconsistent and un- Two things more to note. Basically, they tell us that we are conceding that human subjectivity is important because we would have like a panel that people could appeal to. Listen, that was a total uh, mischaracterization of what we stood for. We think it is true that people can appeal this algorithm if they feel that the algorithm has been biased. But we don't think that this would happen often, and we don't think that that has the same harm because it's not a wealthy elite judiciary, but we think some kind of race and criminal justice, justice experts that would take into consideration the individual appeal. Realize this was simply not true. And in terms of the characterization on juries, I don't think it's particularly relevant at all when we're talking about sentencing here. With all that said, let's look at their big pushes that they brought here, right? That basically, organs are going to be more racist by virtue of their creators being like white Silicon Valley guys. Listen, first and foremost, they can't erase all socioeconomic barriers on their side and then and create this like plethora of diverse judges. Because and if we have to defend racist computer sciences, scientists, I think that's strategically just not sound. But I think what is left of that point is that algorithms then entrench racist data. A few responses. Firstly, judges under their side of the house also take into consideration things like criminal history, etc. And if they're saying that there are racist laws, I think those are racist laws that we can absolutely our side of the house too. That was not exclusive evidence. But additionally, our model literally solves for this, both through not including the decades of historical data that they somehow thought and anticipated we were going to have in our model they should have listened to here. That was not the kind of algorithm we were going to have. Rather, we were going to have with this point-based algorithm where you would say, this is what a person did. Was it violent? How old are they? Have they committed a crime before? Etc. Was this crime violent before? Etc. They clearly were expecting an algorithm we didn't have. But additionally, in terms of race, we literally included race for the purpose of positive discrimination ensuring that your history of marginalization and part and over policing for instance does not count against you that was a very explicit mechanism that we included under our side of the house a benefit we give you but lastly their side does nothing to get rid of the most pernicious forms of discrimination that we literally told you about we had an entire point about things like prejudice exacerbated by media that demonizes muslim men towards poor people or just things like having eaten lunch or not we don't think these are one-offs we don't think these are examples that we can just throw up in the air we think it is structurally proven that poor african-american people are given harsher sentences that people with facial tattoos are given harsher sentences that like you know immigrants and trans women these are people that are given harsher sentences right. because of unlike biases that is something that they never fix at best structural racism they wash but they still never solve this injustice i'm going to deal with their point on accountability as well but i'll take a few away from it tell us how anything changes on the your side when you still have uh, people inputting this data that might be biased listen we think that these are the kinds of biases that are often internalized, that are often subconscious, that people on a whim have when they are sentencing. We think that when you put down, when you collect, when you sit together and make an algorithm and say, listen, this cannot be racist, then we think there's much more likely that you're going to produce an algorithm that isn't racist. But just because that is how you basically, right? That a judge is more easy to hold accountable than an algorithm because an algorithm, for instance, is so hard to understand. To say that you can challenge an algorithm is wrong. Literally, they can see this is a very simple algorithm. So, like, yes. Definitely appeal the different parts of an algorithm, its inputs and its weights, and then review them. They themselves can see this. But listen, we established that there was a problem of accountability and status quo that they didn't deal with at all. They didn't even mention it. 
We told you that judges enjoy symbolic legitimacy and assumption of wisdom. This is problematic. Additionally, we told you that judges are deeply connected to the very powers to keep them in check. Prosecutors, attorneys, colleagues, higher courts, these are all disposed to protecting their sense. In comparison, no one fears the wrath of an algorithm, no one fears they're going to lose the friendship with an algorithm when calling out their racism. But additionally, and lastly, structurally, judges are either elected by tough on crime majorities. They cannot just magic wand and say, oh, the American population today is like really into giving lenient sentences to African Americans. That's not true. But additionally, we think that often judges are given lifetime appointments, which means that the opposition in this round had to prove to us that they were going to overcome all of these structures. That means that minorities are unable to hold judges account. But we also told you that even if we took them at their best and said that both actually do end up getting appealed, both get challenged, we told you that judges are less likely to actually adapt to change because they would have few human fragility become defensive. We don't think that happens with an algorithm. Additionally, an algorithm is just much more likely to be able to be changed. You can take the pieces apart, adapt them, and 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 then them. For all these reasons, accountability was definitely something we took. We're already taking in this round. Without further ado, moving into my third constructive on trust and efficiency. Two sub points. First, thing, sentences being up to judge sub subjectivity creates a lack of trust in the sentencing process, especially when it comes to minority victims. The problem is twofold. Firstly, there exists a trend of inappropriately lenient sentences when it comes to crimes against women and people of color. For instance, despite domestic violence and sexual assault being increasingly likely to be prosecuted, there exists a trend of judges giving lighter sentences to offenders, often not involving any jail time. This is particularly true if the convict is privileged and a first-time offender. This trend then generates a the system, which means that minorities and women no longer feel that it is worth coming forward. Rigorous and reliable sentencing is particularly important in crimes of sexual assault when yeah. victims fear the revenge of the wrath of their offender, for instance. Listen, people being able to rely on the fact that justice is going to be consistent, a fundamental pillar of justice that we told you was harmed under their side, something that was also taken down, this is something that these women deserve. Why does the algorithm solve this then? Because subjectivity is removed from the equation to a much greater extent. An algorithm will not be swayed by the money of an associate's parents or his suit or his fake remorse or his swimming medals. Even if we can see that the algorithm may not be absolutely perfect, the structural reasons why vulnerable minorities do not come forward and women is, is removed. The second part of this point is on more efficiency in the justice system. The problem in status quo is that court systems are massively overburdened to the extent that thousands of people wait years for a trial. To be clear, these are people who have been accused or convicted of the crime. These are disproportionately low-income individuals who can't afford to post bail, who don't have private lawyers advocating for advancement in their cases. Algorithms solve for this problem directly by making the sentencing process more efficient. On their side, sentencing hearings take up to several days, especially if there's a complicated case. Now the entire process can take a fraction of the time. The impact here is that jails no longer are a long-term holding cell for poor people who can't afford bail or lawyers. These people being able to return more quickly to their communities means less time away from their families and means that they are less likely to lose their jobs. Trust and efficiency panel were exclusive benefits to algorithmic sentencing that second off will have to respond to proud to propose. I thank the second proposition speaker and invite the second speaker of the opposition. Hear, hear. All right, can everyone hear and see me properly? Cool. Just kidding. Own time around. Okay, let's roll. The justice system exists because there is a certain standard by which we believe all humans ought to be treated, regardless of who they are or where they come from. When somebody fails to uphold that standard, that's when we hold them accountable through the law. In this debate, Proposition undermines the standard within the justice system itself by dehumanizing victims and simplifying their human experiences into a number from one to ten. It's unacceptable and unsupportable. Let's clarify a few things. Firstly, about political capital. They tell us that we don't actually have political capital to do the reforms that we want to do on our side of the house. Let me tell you why that's not true. What they are proposing is completely upending the status quo. First of all, we are completely replacing judges within the system of sentencing. But on top of that, we also need to have the funding in order to develop this sort of algorithm, paying off this private company. We think that reasonably, they need more political capital on their side of the house to revamp justices than we do just to have some simple reforms. And secondly, onto bias. They gave us two factors for bias. First of all, arbitrary things, like you had that day or how you were feeling. Secondly, discrimination. 
First of all, on the arbitrary things, we think this is ridiculous. Judges become judges because they care about justice, right? And they try to be as non-biased as possible, and they're trained to do that. But secondly, they can't be biased because judges are held accountable. Firstly, by the public who watches that trial, and secondly, by judge investigation. And onto discrimination, right? This idea that judges will continue to be racist and sexist and lenient to those who look like them. The same idea as above. But secondly, compared the house, the daughter itself is racist, right? Because if you're asking questions like, has this person committed a crime before? Where do they live? What's their social economic because of class injustices, that is inherently racist. So the way that you have to deal with this is not just forget about race, but you need humans there who think about it, realize that these issues, and then actively try not to discriminate against these people. Right? So we told you with the political capital that they have on their side of the house, we'd have some really important reforms, right? We have diverse judges, diverse juries, right? And more routes to accountability, right? Meaning that, uh, and let's remember here that they like this on their side of the house. It's why realize yes, people will make mistakes and you should be able to appeal this to a higher court. So they value these diverse panels, which we tell you we get on our side of the house. Then onto accountability, they tell us they can be held accountable because it's going to be transparent. They'll explain how this algorithm works to people. Why is that not realistic? Well, because as I said, it's going to be a private company to tell people how their algorithm works. That's the most realistic interpretation here. And that's exactly what's happening in the US with the system they have, with Compass. Nobody knows how it works expert because it's proprietary information for that company. But secondly, even if they got the company to release it, which is very unlikely, it would be very difficult to explain to them. The fact is that we understand the way a judge would explain it based on emotions, based on the circumstances that that person is facing. Therefore, it's incredibly hard to hold us accountable. But secondly, you tell us that we don't hold judges accountable. That's simply not true. Let's use their own example of Brock Turner, where the judge was held accountable by having hundreds of thousands of people sign a petition have him removed from office. It's like any John had told you how we are biased towards this data because we believe it must be right because it's some complicated algorithm. We don't do that with judges. We think they're dumb humans and hold them accountable for that. And the only way they get change on their side of the house is if you can rally the justice system as a whole to change how the algorithm work. That looks like rallying a Senate or rallying a Congress. We don't think that's possible. And the rest will be integrated. So now let's talk about how we best adapt to changing societal values. So we think in this debate, Everything that we think is right or wrong changes from time to time. But we're not talking about changing the laws and mandatory punishments because neither side has the fiat to change the actual law. So who can, within the current guidelines, keep up with social progress? On our side, social movements like Black Lives Matter or E2 um, changes judges' perspective in two ways. First of all, they prove that given how widespread and brutal an issue they may have become, harsher sentences need to be given to protect victims. Secondly, given hyper-awareness around these types of issues, the crime should be viewed more severely because there are no more excuses anymore. Everybody should know that it's terrible. And that's exactly what Me Too managed to do in countries around the world. Countries like South Africa, countries like Mexico, where we see judges passing harsher sentences. Yeah, I'll take it here. Black Lives Matter has been around for decades, and yet still thousands of police officers accused of brutality are showed kindness by judges and do yeah. not get put in account. So, first of all, yes, Black Lives Matter has been around. We think it's been most powerful recently, and this is where it's going to have effects. And we see that around the world, right? Cases of racism are being dealt with more seriously in line with how society is changing. But moreover, we told you how we have reforms on our side of the house too, so we don't only have old racist white judges making decisions. So why do judges listen to what society is saying? Well, first of all, because they read the same news, they see the protests, and they feel the pain, so they understand these issues. But secondly, they have an incentive to keep up with societal values because it reflects well on them. And otherwise, they get in the same situation that the judge that served up a six-month sentence for Brock Turner got, where the entire world turns on them. So on our side of the house, we get that social progress. Um, people have to buy into that. But why don't they get it on their side? First of all, as we explained to you in Johnny's speech, these aren't going to be these incredible algorithms that are incredibly sophisticated, right? As they said, it weighs up, weighs up a few factors like age, like how many crimes you've committed. And it definitely can't comprehend more complex, more nuanced things like, given the current societal climate, how shall I change my output here? We don't think that something these algorithms could do. But even if they could do that, right, it's not in our case where individual judges are convinced of something based on what society is thinking. It is a situation by which we have to completely change the justice system, as I told you earlier. That means rallying a Senate or rallying a House 
to make these decisions, which we don't think is in the realm of reality. And even if it was possible to do that, it would take years and always be behind social progress. Just imagine trying to get the US Senate to pass legislation to change an algorithm every time society thinks something different. So by this stage in the debate, we've proven to you how we get better decision making because we're less biased, we're less generalized, and we're more accountable. And lastly, we're most in line with social progress. But now let's chuck all that out the window. So regardless of decision making, how do we still win today's debate? It's because the proposition necessarily dehumanizes victims and makes them buy out of the system. In sentencing hearings, one of the most powerful factors is that a victim can testify and the extent to which they can prove they were harmed gives a larger sentence. Right? Remember, it's something that's incredibly difficult for the victim to do, letting your fears and out in public, yet victims do it to get justice and because they feel as if they're being listened to by a judge who understands their humanity and their position. On their side of the house, these raw emotions and representations of humanity are turned into a basket of issues, a few numbers from one to ten. First of all, we don't think these emotions are quantifiable. You can't give it to this computer algorithm. But secondly, it's incredibly dehumanizing and hurtful for a victim to be told that their suffering is a seven out of 10. And then to be told that the criminal that hurt them gets a certain sentence with no explanation from a judge about exactly why they're getting that sentence. So because victims are being treated so badly, we think you have to disregard their case absolutely. But on top of that, there's the practical concern of victims are less likely to testify and engage with the system when they feel so dehumanized by it, right? Because remember, even to an extent in the status quo, victims do not testify because they feel as if they're not being hurt. They exacerbate that issue to unimaginable uh, levels, meaning that they disincentivize victims from coming forward, coming forward to testify in court, meaning that more perpetrators get off with shorter sentences. But this also applies to defendants. They too get human dehumanized. They too believe they've been treated unfairly when it is this AI, meaning that they're less likely to feel guilt, less likely to feel remorse, and less likely to uh, feel a sense that I need to engage in rehab. Because of these reasons, I'm so proud to propose. Thank you. I thank the second speaker of the opposition and invite the third speaker of the proposition. Here, here. Okay, um, can anyone hear me right here? So Because team opposition critically, critically refused to engage with our actual model, with what we actually stood for in this debate, because they refused to develop their case, because they refused to ensure that it actually was the, that it was actually compatible with what we brought to you, they have ultimately lost today's debate. Proud to propose. In my speech, I'm going to be looking at two main themes. Firstly, asking who gets the best sentencing, and secondly, asking at, looking at who gets the best amount of, of uh, accountability. Okay. Firstly, on the best sentencing, note here that either when they talk to you about how the data will be bad, they didn't listen to our model and only explicitly explain to you how we would set this up, what we would take into account, or they just failed to adapt their case, which I would, which was, which either way loses them a lot of the point. And I would love to hear some engagement with that on opposition number three. Further, they wanted to talk to you about how algorithms will inherently be biased, either because of the developers and the data. Noted that was fatally uncomparative because in all positions of power, they will always be permeated by the most privileged group. It is not just unique to algorithm developers. Here they try to try to save themselves with a stance where they talk about major reforms, about funding minority groups and getting them there. Now, Mybert already gave you three reasons as to why that doesn't help them, about how it's a concession, first of all, how it will always be the most privileged and advantaged minorities being there, and how it doesn't address the heart of the problems of our case, meaning that a lot of the sub human subjectivity points that we gave you, which were critically undone, still stands and still loses them this round. Now, why will still not why will it still not win them the debate? Firstly, because they're not because they're not actually engaging with the rest of our points. And furthermore, because a lot of the privileged judges that they they seem to be the problem will still be there, will still be a step ahead either because of the lifetime appointments that are there, because of the good connections that they have, 
or simply because they are not as accountable for all of these structural reasons that we gave to you. If they want to have that change, they needed to address these structural reasons that we gave you. They failed to do what? so. No, thank you. Then what did they tell you? They talked to you about how the data is inherently bad. Note, Mybrid already told you how our model accounts for this. Furthermore, they wanted to talk to you about how developers will just make these, these developing these algorithms bad. Not here, developers will, per our model, be punished for bad algorithms. We'll be able to have an open source algorithm where we can see what is put into it, how it's weighed, and that will give it public scrutiny, ensuring that they have no incentives in their most worst what? case to actually make a bad algorithm. No, thank you. Because number one, they're literally developing something with the data put in that the government says we want have to have these specific data points. Secondly, because these people are profit incentivized. They literally want to protect their income and reputation. But if they're hung out for making a wrong algorithm when it's appealed, or wrong algorithm when something is found out to be wrong, we say that that goes out of the window. We don't think they can win on that ground either way. What did we tell you then? We gave you structural reasons as to why judges are likely to be biased. We told you about how they'll most likely sympathize with someone from their own background. No, thank you. That is Point. not help, no thank you. Even if you take them at their best, we say that this is not helped just by having more minorities because there are still going to be these bad judges. There are still going to be unjust sentencing. And it still doesn't address the fact that if two people committed the same crime and their sentencing is given, it is up to whether to what kind of judge they get rather than, than what they actually did, rather than the facts of their case. But let's just engage in their worst case scenario where we say, if bias can exist on both sides of the house, we say that we eliminate the worst and most powerful discrimination because they wanted to give you the false narrative that judges are not the issue and it's only systemic issues. However, judges have significant leeway, no thank you, when giving certain sentences, whether or not they want to give four years or eight years. That is the, that is the thing where we are addressing the actual problems because the discrimination that ju of judges often go above and beyond what can be created by essentially flawed data if we, if we buy any of what they talk to on your side. This means that even the best rest, the richest minorities, will get a similar or longer sentence than a white person with a worse criminal record or a white cop accused of blatant brutality. This critical bias is what we get rid of on our side that ultimately wins us the round. And note here, this also aligns with our stance where we told you we don't have to prove that it's 100% perfect, but given that we can prove that it's comparatively better, we say that we win today's debate. What? Before I go, before going on, I'll take it. Is this the case? Would you let AI accept trials and decide guilty verdicts instead of judges? We think that there are technical differences differences between deciding guilty verdicts and deciding a sentencing. We say that because of those technical differences, we don't let do this because, a, because an AI is not able to, for instance, listen to an entire trial and then decide if they're guilty or not. We think putting in certain factors of the crime and what you did is far better. Note here that in our best case, we have proven, no thank you, that there are comparatively better sentencing on the side, both because of the racial bias, but also because social factors and stereotypes are not put in, both because you don't affect that same thing. Lastly, they want to talk about how it dehumanizes victims. Note here, victims still heard when, de when determining guilt, which also clashes directly with our third point about how there'll be more trust and efficiency. So when you believe, for instance, as a, as a survivor of sexual assault, when you believe that the person who sexually assaulted you will actually be sentenced, will actually be, uh, will actually be, be punished, for, then you're more likely to come forward. We heard no engagement with that on their side of the house. I'd love to hear that from third up as well. Yeah. They also didn't engage with the efficiency point that Mybert gave you, which also loses them the debate. Furthermore, we say that justice isn't always about revenge or retribution. There should be objective responses we have to crimes against new society. So it's two people who committed the same crime shouldn't just get extremely different punishment because one of the victims testified or one of the victims seemed more empathetic than the other because these impact statements disproportionately harms minority, given the analysis we gave to you about a privileged judge being more inclined to feel empathetic towards a victim that looks like him or a victim they can relate to. That is not something they can, that they can just disregard on their side. Thank you. So on, clearly on this theme of getting better sentences, we have won this round. But moving on to the idea of accountability. Note here, on their worst, where we have better sentences, they've already lost. But at their best, when we assume that they can be subjective or bad sentences 
on both sides. We said that the side that is better at addressing these failures, you know, thank you, and ensuring that they won't happen again, wins. Okay, what did we, what did we tell you? The important thing here again is that they completely disregarded our model once again, where they talked to you about how, oh, the producers won't just release it. No, see, we already said that it will have to be open source, it will have to be open to media scrutiny. They never engaged with why we wouldn't be able to do that, other than the fact that the, the producers wouldn't want to do it. No, here, if that is the thing, like, if that is the thing that they have to do, they have to ensure that the public can see it in order for them to actually produce this algorithm and to make money off of it, we think they will. What kind of measures of accountability did they give to you? They give you one minute to throw away about like how they'll have less accountability because people think machines are infallible and people don't understand the actual data. Note here, we already said in our model, there'll be experts telling you what happened with this data. And furthermore, we say that people have a, have a general idea of machines being, being suspicious and not really wanting to do this. Furthermore, they talk about operating petitions. Note here, all of this ignores all the structural analysis we brought to you down the bench, about the symbolic legitimacy and respect of judges, how they're connected to the power structure supposed to keep them accountable, and how the system in and of itself leaves them unaccountable. The problem with scrutiny is that not that only a small amount of cases actually garner that much, much attention, and even if it does, it's often short-term and ineffective, giving structural change. change. And even like if you be, believe that they'll become better analogy, we say that that was what's going to take such a long time and because for that reason, we are so proud to be standing on such today. I thank the third speaker of the proposition and invite the third speaker of the opposition to deliver the final constructive case. Here, here. Can you guys hear? Okay. Biases can exist in determining a verdict. They can exist in determining jurors. Those are structural reasons as to why the justice system is flawed in its entirety. Replacing sentencing systems with AI isn't going to solve those complexities. And we think it's been a lie that they claim such benefits when they aren't able to actually achieve it. So when we're valuing this debate, what are the things that you ought to take into account as adjudicators? The metrics are simple, twofold. Number one, the nuances of these crimes and whether or not we can reasonably say that AI is able to have to like compute such nuances and come up with better decisions than judges. Secondly, in terms of like the overall effect and whether or not we'll even be even be able to feasibly do this on our side, are we going to have a better or change within the justice system itself? Note that their strategy from the beginning was flawed, because if you're going to say that AI is important to the point where you determine where individuals are going to spend the rest of their lives, are you going to determine whether they spend 10 years in prison or 25 years in prison? Those are big decisions that we said ought to be made by humans in the first place. Secondly, we think that even valuing an appeal system means that they don't have complete faith within their own model because we think the smart or more principally aligned thing for them to answer our POIs and just like speak about this appeal system was to have no appeal means because they understand that they did like support themselves entirely or even if they said that they wanted that they decided that the verdict should be decided by humans they have to give us reasonable ideas as to why they thought that like the nuances of determining sentencing like race and socioeconomic backgrounds couldn't apply to determining the verdict so now that we've cleared up that strategy, let's get on into the two clashes of number one, are algorithms dependable? And secondly, are we able to achieve accountability as a mechanism on either side? Let's speak about a majority of their case because they're very quick to say that we're, we weren't responding to what they're speaking about. They brought us three things mainly. Number one, the idea of subjectivity. So this idea that like, the lunch that I have as a judge will depend on how much I like how much I choose to sentence an individual or secondly this idea of like other things that are arbitrary that judges take into account 
that if you think those flaws are so astronomical to a point where you're going to replace that human and all the work that they've studied for, then we think you should replace them in determining a verdict because we think similar things can happen there. We don't understand why it was mutually exclusive to determining sentencing. But even here, we told you that those things can't just can't be taken into account because we don't necessarily think AI is perfect to a point where there aren't going to be biases from other individuals that created that AI. Secondly, we think they say to us, or how they try to sell us on this AI, is that they say it's simple enough for individuals to understand, but complex enough to evaluate a person's decisions, to evaluate why a person did something and say how they ought to spend the rest of their life, or like how much they ought to pay for the crime that they did. Note the slight tension there, because if you're going to say that this AI is so complex to the point where it's able to take such things into consideration and be reasonable and be fair, um, more fair than humans, then you also have to explain to us how it's able to be simple to the point where individuals are able to understand that. But moreover, they have to explain to us why they thought that individuals would be even likely to appeal such a perfect system if you're going to paint it as such. On top of that, we think we need to we need to have a clear understanding of who was going to input this data. That becomes very detrimental to their case if they're not clear about it, because then we have a plethora of other questions, like how do we ensure that the data isn't going to be biased? How do we ensure that the AI is able to develop time and time again to de like to developing societal uh, morals and societal changes? We needed to have got clarity there because it becomes important if we're talking about AI that has to consider each and every individual's um, aspect or like background. But I'll take this POI. Nope, we already told you it will be an open source algorithm. We told you exactly what we would put in it, and we would told you exactly how we would have accountability for it. Please engage with the actual things we told you in this. Listen, case. the problem there is again, it's very, very vague. Why does that become a problem when we're speaking about if it's going to be dependable? Because it's just, if it's open source, if they say that there are all these checking mechanisms, we needed to have gotten a clear body because in the same way that the courting system or like, sorry, the law system works right now, when we have a clear body deciding and giving information, like um, judges are able to weigh in there and have lawyers, we need to get a clear source of this data. We don't think to just say it's open source so therefore we have to trust the data that comes in because it's critical for ai to function on dependable data we don't think we're ever ever able to get yeah. answers to that question very very harmful in terms of proving the dependability of those algorithms themselves we don't think they're complex enough to understand individuals therefore we think the impact of this win has to fall to side opposition because we're able to show to you that this ai itself is something that the side proposition doesn't even have full trust in when they say they still have verdicts and appeal courts exist. Second clash on accountability and which side is able to have it the most. Note that a lot of their analysis here was about speaking about judges and the superior, superiority complexes that exist there. The accounting, like the taking mechanisms that currently don't work because of the corrupt system of the um, like the law system and how they're able to protect themselves. On our side, we don't think we support those things, but on your side, reasonably, we don't think we even get, like, we don't think your accountability is something that's different from ours, because if we are going to have, like, the capital of, because we didn't invest in this AI, we're going to have capital in order to reform these, play, uh, these, these sort of problems easier or, like, better yeah. on our side, because we attack structural problems and we don't completely, like, force in a new mechanism that isn't even proven to be dependable by side proposition. On top of that, we spoke to you about how that complexity or, or like, moral standing within those judges can exist, that it, because it exists, we think we're able to achieve better accountability. Why is that so? Firstly, we think when humans have this idea of like another human, they're just more likely to be able to even appeal to those to that individual just because of the fact that they're human. But if we take into consideration side propositions, very like um idealistic idea of what that AI would look like, it means you're even less like you're even likely to have less individuals being able to appeal that system or be able to tackle that system because of perfectionist by like perfectionist ideas that exist. Even within their own case, they are unable to show to us how the perfection will exist anyway. Because if they're going to talk about the most harmful individuals, individuals that have been victims of gender-based violence or victims of like um 
top, top, top triumphal discrimination. We think those individuals are less likely to appeal to a system if they feel that they haven't gotten the fullest amount of justice because we think it's perfected. Because we think the, like the society's view of what technology looks like will play very uh, largely into how individuals are able to interact with the law system itself. On top of that, when we're speaking about public engagement and how they said they would have accountability, why is it just not likely to exist? The experts that they're speaking about, the humans that are able to explain to you, how much time is that going to take? Because if you're going to claim efficiency and then have a world where you're able to just like appeal and have to explain complex AI, like AI to individuals, it doesn't even have to be complex. You think you have to start on a base of understanding like basic IT, then you have to go on to explain why that data was captured a certain way. Then you have to go on to explain why they fed that uh, the machine that data in the first place. We don't even think there are exclusive like benefits of efficiency and the idea that you don't have to spend time within these pr prison cells even exists because you still have the idea of you still, uh, you still have ideas of it lagging and taking time. We ultimately win on this cash of accountability. We ultimately do better because we still have the human input of judges. I thank the third opposition speaker and invite the opposition reply to conclude the opposition case. Here, here. humans as biased, subjective, inefficient, and harmful. Yet they forget two main things. One, the people that put in the data did their characterization. Yet they are fine with that. Two, the panel that uh, that cases are appealed to reflect their characterization. Yet they are fine with that as well. What does this mean? It means, one, they waste political capital on being redundant because they're still using human biases that they object to. But two, they still rely on all the biases that they wanted to run away from. They lose that debate just based on that. What was our model? We told you that we will use our fiat in this debate to have structural changes that actually cause the systemic problems uh, against minorities and broader issues. We told you we'll have more diversity to reform the affirmative, affirmative action. But more than that, we'll have resources for legal education so that minorities can now access it, be lawyers, be judges, there's more representation in the jury. We tell you all they said to our model is that no, they'll just be rich minorities being uh, in power. What we told you here is that the issue is about relatability, racism, and a lack of understanding. When you have a black judge, even if they're rich in their worst case, we tell you that they, they still can't be racist. They still can have an, a sense of empathy. They can still have a sense of understanding. They have to work their way up. They're way more likely to have relatability on our side of the house. We think that we can still do this. We think that they've uh, swirled the, the debate into saying that just because they're rich people doesn't mean that you can have our model standing. They lose that debate on that ground as well. Now let's deal with the, the, main, the major point of this debate, which is about accountability. So, panel, what they've told us here is that the reason why you can't get accountability is because people are inherently respect judges, and judges are corrupt, but more than that, they have an appeal system that works on um, a furthermore a diverse panel. What we have told you here is a couple of things. One, there's perfection bias that exists, where machines are often seen as infallible and perfect. And if they're so advanced that they're already making sense in the decisions, we say that it applies more. When you invest so much into big corporations and the government is funding this, we tell you that that uh, exacerbates the machine uh, perfection bias. But second of all, and most importantly, we tell you that you can't understand what this machine and what this computer algorithms are saying. Because one, it's not a language. And two, you need to be an expert to design it, to understand it, to understand all the numbers that come in there. But thirdly, in their worst case, which they've denied, it's not transparent because we don't see why a big company would want to make everything transparent. We tell you in their best case, nobody understands what this tangibly looks like. They can't appeal it and they can't understand why that reasoning was there. What the comparative realistically is, because now this is kind of running on a, parable, a parallel of who's accountable and who's not. We tell you that one, on our side, a judge has to give reasoning, has to say why they made the decisions very structurally. 
two, we told you that it's very easy to compare cases, right? Like as we give the examples in my own model about the North Carolina um, uh, Racial Justice Act, where if you show that your like sentencing was racially motivated, whereas a similar case was not like that, and it were two different sentences, you can appeal it. Why is this important? Because it's a language. You can understand the, the realistic mechanisms of that. You can understand what the judge is saying at all times. You don't need a tech lawyer. You don't have to like have somebody to access like incredibly complicated data at all. But third of all, we tell you judges can get fired and can be held accountable in that world as well. We, we tell you in the comparative, it's really hard to hold an algorithm accountable. So in a worst case, even if the judges are racist, even if the judges are bad, at least we have accountability mechanisms that ensure that this does not apply. We tell you that their comparative to um, uh, their comparative to our entire case about minorities, so the entire case about minorities being able to structurally advance themselves uh, when they said that like we all just have rich minorities. We tell you their comparative is rich white Silicon Valley men. We don't see why they win in that situation at, at all. In our worst case, and this is incredibly important, in our worst case one racist bad judge hurts a couple of individuals. We see that we don't want that, but that is our worst case. In their worst case, a bad and a negligent person makes an entire algorithm that screws up and hurts every single person it touches. We think they hurt less people than hurt more people and make a corrupt system. Thank you. I thank the opposition reply and invite the proposition reply to conclude this debate. Hear, hear. Everyone hear me? The problem with opposition in this round was that they apparently had the political will and capital to give working class minorities elite law school educations. Yet they also said that people creating this algorithm under our side would be the worst biased Silicon Valley dudes blind to racism. That was silly. That was just implausible. Let us be clear with what we stood for in this round. We stood for that there would be some kind of political change under each side of the house. What we allowed was that, what we said this allowed us to do, was to have a state buy or collaborate with computer scientists and create an algorithm. We also said this allowed us to have a diverse panel that in cases of a defendant feeling they had been unjustly sentenced, then they could appeal to that panel. Not only was that much more in touch with the status quo, but it was also much more in touch with the field of each team actually was in this round. Two questions then in my reply, firstly on bias sentencing and then secondly on algorithms. And I think the bias sentencing thing, I think the narrative that what victims want is a face and a human was superficial. What victims want is justice. So I think insofar that we can prove that that was what we gave to, gave to them under our side of the house, I think that also fell Sarah Reddick's team. But now, what were the underlying causes of injustice? Yes, some of them were arbitrary. They said this, were, this was ridiculous. But I would say that when a Columbia University study shows that prisoners are two to six times more likely to be given early parole after judges ate lunch, it was maybe not that ridiculous after all. But additionally, we said that injustices were sometimes caused by big structural things, prior convictions, for instance. But at best, they had this too, especially if they were never change any laws on the best of accounts. But then additionally, what we wish was to implement an affirmative action mechanism that meant automatically more lenient sentences to marginalize over police groups, something they never engaged in. But lastly, and most importantly, panel, all of the internalized biases that are often subconscious, they said that this was just going to be entrenched in the algorithm. But listen, even if we say that computer scientists and criminal justice experts making this algorithm were biased, we think bias can really only to a limited extent be in the kind of algorithm that we proposed. This is what we said we wanted. We wanted a series of text boxes, a computer with input boxes, like what was the crime committed? Was it violent or was it non-violent? Does this person have a history of crime? What kind of crime do they have a history of? And then lastly, race for the purpose of positive discrimination. I think this was where we ensured a consistency in sentencing. This was we ensured impartiality. 
Now, in terms of bias, they also brought you an idea of like having social change. I think this was very assertive. I think Sarah already mentioned this, but we could also, it was just feasible for us to also say that we could update our organ. It could change with time. And if history is anything to go by, then social change has had very little effect on judges. Brock Turner was one in a million. You think the undocumented women, the sex workers, the trans women, these are people that do not get the outrage that Brock Turner got. These are the people who were silenced under this. Lastly, on accountability, let us take them at their best and say, would we prefer a biased algorithm or a biased judge? Listen, this was a problematic tension in their case, where they said this algorithm was both too complicated and too simple. They could never have both happened. We were very clear. We said this algorithm would be open sourced, meaning that everyone would have access to the input factors and the weight of these input factors in the output. We also said it could be appealed. And we said, importantly, it did not have any of these structural things that were literally the barrier in terms of accountability of judges. We told you that judges are large things that were appointed by top and crime majorities or like appointed by a Republican leader. They are in there for life. So even in a scenario where you have diverse judges, you don't just eliminate those judges. But then also we told you that judges have things like the objective and professional glaze that the pop, pop opposition literally proved to you was a case and was prevalent in society that narrative. At the end of the day, even if our algorithm was biased, we would prefer a biased algorithm to a biased judge every single day of the week. So proud to have one of I thank the proposition reply and I thank all the speakers for this fine debate. Um, since you cannot shake hands, I'm just going to write to the ORCOM to move you out of the breakout room and we're going to try to be as fast as possible in order to have a decision and give the decision fast. Thanks for the debate, guys.